pastoring is a hard gig. It really is. And when life hits you and, and you still decide just to show up, this is what I know. The Lord always honors that. Amen. He honors a faithful <coughs> servant. The Bible says when I return, will I find any faithful among you? God's just looking for some people to be faithful. Hallelujah. Amen. So I'm honored to be here with all of you tonight. I actually did not know that you guys had um, some addiction ministries. Is that right? There's some, some addiction ministries here with us tonight. And so I was telling Jordan earlier today, I was telling her what I was preaching on. And I don't like to run it by other people so they can tell me if it's a bad idea, you know. <laughs> Not really, I would have preached on it anyway. But, Amen. Uh, That's right. Come on now. <laughs> I was telling Jordan what I was preaching on, and she was like, you know that they... Uh, what's it called? Unaddicted? Is Good. that what you said it was called? Man, that's beautiful. So I had no idea um, that I was walking in to this tonight. Amen. Demons being cast out in here with some addiction ministries. I really do feel right at home. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why. I had not planned on doing this. It is not part of the message, so don't start timing me yet, okay? <laughs> You're going to be really disappointed, okay? So a little bit about myself, I was bound by addiction for 15 years of my life. Um, in the year 2012, I cried out to the Lord and I said, listen, I've heard about you. I didn't even know how to pray, right? I was just saying what I knew how to say. I was like, look, I've heard about you and this is the deal. If you're real, you're going to have to prove to me that you're real. And the next eight to nine months of my life was the Lord proving to me over and over again that He was real. Amen. The worst that it had ever been. I was taking pills to make myself feel better, and then I had to take different pills to help myself stay awake. Amen. I was doing all of the things. If you could have thought it, I was doing it. I was so bad and bound in addiction that I honestly didn't think that I would ever come out of it. So in August of 2013, I woke up one day and I was done. Anybody yeah. ever felt like that? Yeah. You're just yeah. done. Yeah. Your life is turned into nothing but destruction and you're just done. So in August of 2013, I came to that pivotal moment in my life. And I decided I, there was a bottle of pills on the kitchen counter that had just got filled the day before. I looked at that bottle of pills and I was like, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to take every one of them in one day. And so I did. I grabbed that bottle of pills and a bottle of water and I started to walk up the street in our town in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. And as I walked, I began to take every single one of those pills in that bottle. I took 94 tab 10s in one day. In, in a short span of about 45 minutes. That's how done I was. I don't know where I thought I was going walking down that road other than the fact that I was going to bust hell wide open because I didn't know Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I end up in this this back of this church, I came up to it. There was this little bridge that went over this little creek. We're from the country too, amen. So we have creeks too in Tennessee. And so I, I found this little bridge and, and my body was tired at this point. It was hot. It was like 104 degrees outside that day. And so I said, well, that bridge looks like a good place. So I went and I got on the back of that bridge and I sat down and I don't know how long I sat there for because the next thing I knew it was well into the night and I woke up in a ditch in the front of the church. Now listen, go. I can't tell you to this day how I made it from the back of that church on that bridge to the front of that ditch, but this is what I know. When I woke up in that ditch, I encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Places where you know that 
that people understand that life is messy yeah. and yeah. and the tricks of the enemy they're sneaky right yes. he yeah. sets traps for us we fall into that yeah. I like churches that we go that they know that there's a spirit realm yeah. and there's something yeah. warring against you in the spirit realm yeah. amen and so listen tonight I don't know really where this message is going to go, but I do know that when I was inquiring of the Lord, he gave me this message. I've never preached it, so if it's bad, don't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> That's my rule of thumb. I I'll practice on y'all, and if it's good, I'll use it again. <laughs> Not really. Come on now. I mean, maybe. If it's real good, I will use it again, though. Don't put it past me. So if you see me online one day and you're like, wait a minute, she preached that message here. Yep, and if it was good, I'm going to preach it again. Amen. <laughs> so listen, here recently the Lord's had me in the Old Testament. I heard a good pastor friend of ours say a couple weeks ago, you know, if, if somebody knows the Bible, they get up and they preach out of the Old Testament. Amen. And I thought to myself in that moment, I've got to start preaching out of the Old Testament or people are like, I don't know the Bible. <laughs> and so... I've been in the book of Exodus for a while. I'm actually writing my first book right now called Encounter the Glory. And so I've been studying the life of Moses and how he went from glory to glory. And I won't tell you all my book because then, you know, it will just ruin the whole thing. But I've been in the book of Exodus for some time now. And I've really been studying about when the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the hand of Pharaoh. And so what you have in the book of Exodus is you have Moses, who was supposed to be killed as a child. Listen, I'm convinced wow. the devil was after Moses before he was ever even conceived Come on. in the womb. Amen. 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 And so Moses was supposed to be killed as a child because Pharaoh had sent forth a decree that all of the born sons of the Israelites were going to have to be murdered because... They were outnumbering the Egyptians at that time, and Pharaoh couldn't have that. So the mother of Moses, she puts him in this, this little basket, and she hides him in the bush in the river, amen. And Pharaoh's daughter happens to stumble upon Moses. And this is just the favor of the Lord. It goes to tell you that it doesn't matter what the devil tries, the Lord always wins. Yeah. He's John and he's seeing he wins every battle, amen. amen. And so... Uh, Pharaoh ends up growing up in, in the king's house with Pharaoh and his daughter. The beautiful thing is Moses got to go back to his birth mom and she got to nurse him until he was weaned off of nursing. And I don't know about you, but that just seems like a whole miracle from the Lord in my Amen. opinion. And so Moses grows up as an Egyptian even though he was an Israelite. And Moses encounters the Lord at the burning bush. And the Bible says that an angel of the Lord came to Moses and instructed Moses to take off his shoes for the ground which he stood was holy. Now in those days, the custom of the children of Israel were if they were going to enter into a covenant, they didn't have contracts. They didn't sign things like we do. They don't sign their life away to buy a house back in those days. Amen. What they would do is they would take off their shoes. Where I grew up in the South in Tennessee, I grew up believing that a man's handshake was his word. That's what I grew up believing. And so back in those days, their taking off of their shoes was their word. And so when Moses took off his shoes at that burning bush, he entered into a covenant with the Holy One of Israel. And the life of Moses from that point went from glory to glory because he encountered the Shekinah glory of the Lord in that burning bush. And everywhere that Moses went from that moment on in his life, Moses encountered the glory of the Lord. Moses was instructed to go before the king Pharaoh of those days. And he went in and he said, we probably all heard the story. He went to Pharaoh. He said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, I will do no such thing. The Lord sent plague after plague after plague until they get to the tenth plague and the angel of death passes by. And so they had to put the blood on the doorpost. If you're tracking with me, say amen. amen. You know what I'm talking about, right? And so the children of Israel, they get delivered after that point. Pharaoh had had enough. The angel of death came through, killed all the livestock, all the, the firstborn of all the houses. It was a tragic time for Pharaoh, but he should have listened to the Lord the first time. Amen. Amen. Listen, the Lord's only going to give you so many warnings, okay? And so 
uh, the angel of death comes through, and then they get to this Red Sea moment. And we love to talk about the Red Sea moment, right? But listen, this is what we have to understand about the moment of the Red Sea in the life of the children of Israel. These people had been in bondage. They had been slaves to Pharaoh. They were literally making bricks and mortar for, for the Egyptians for years and years and years. So they finally get delivered out of the slavery of Egypt. They get to this Red Sea. Pharaoh had changed his mind and decided that he was going to send an army after the children of Israel to bring them back into captivity. Now listen, I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to be super spiritual either. If that was me standing at the Red Sea and I look back and all of the sudden when Moses is saying, God's going to deliver us, God's going to deliver us. And we finally feel like we get set free and then we look back and there's the enemy again. I would have been like, um, Moses, I feel like you lied to us, bro. Okay? Like you did not tell the truth. You brought us here to die. And the truth is, is that the children of Israel felt the same way. But by the gracious hand of the Lord, Moses put down his staff. The waters of the Red Sea parted. That was a miracle to behold. Now these people must have been crazy. That's all I can think. Because I'm sorry, if you take me up to an ocean... And the ocean splits in half. Come and on. you expect me to walk through the middle of the Come ocean. On. Amen. I don't know. I might have stayed in Egypt. I'm just, I'm just saying, <laughs> right? Like, that's crazy. Can you imagine the fear that the people had in that day, in that moment? Because at any moment, those waters could have came back and washed over them and killed every last one of them. And guess what? That's exactly what happened to Pharaoh in the camp of the enemy. Because who the sun sets free is truly free indeed. So the Lord drowned the camp of Pharaoh, all that army that was after the children of Israel. They get out into the wilderness. I'm going somewhere. This still ain't the message, but if you are time me, you can't start right now. Amen. <laughs> So the children of Israel get out into the wilderness and the Lord is doing all kinds of miracles for them. Y'all, I'm talking about the Lord put a cloud in the sky by day and fire by night to lead yeah. the children of Israel. The Lord brought water from a rock. He literally gave them shoes on their feet that would grow with their feet. Amen. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. Amen. I need some shoes like that because shoes are expensive, hallelujah. Lord, can we get some shoes that will grow with our feet, especially when you're raising kids? Somebody give me a witness, you know. And, and especially if you're raising teenage boys, help me, Holy Ghost, I need some shoes that grow. So... So they get out in the wilderness. The Lord's doing all of these different kinds of miracles, right? And the children of Israel, that they are literally getting fresh manna from heaven every single day. They go out and there is fresh manna on the ground for them every single day. And you know what they were doing? They were complaining. They were complaining. Moses, did you bring us out here to perish? Moses, did you bring us out here to die? If I would have been Moses, I would have been like, if you do not shut up in the name of Jesus, amen. Yeah. And, and so they're doing all this murmuring and all this chattering. They were watching the Lord do miracles. And they had unbelief. The Bible in the book of Hebrews says that the children of Israel at that time did not enter into the promised land because of their unbelief. They were watching a God do miracles after miracles after miracles who had delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh. But let me tell you something that you should never forget. God can deliver you from Pharaoh, but if you do not break out of the bondage of your Egypt and you do not break out of the same to your promised land. You see, you can be delivered from the hand of the enemy and you cannot pull down every stronghold and cast down every imagination and take every thought captive unto the obedience of Christ and you are still in the bondage of your Egypt. The 
church likes to teach deliverance, but we don't like to teach the fact that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the what? To the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ. You see, we want to be delivered from Pharaoh, but we like to stay in the bondage of Egypt because it feels good. Right? It's comfortable. It's what we know. When I first came out of addiction, I would find myself doing the stupidest things. And I would think to myself, why am I doing this? Because I was still in the bondage of my addiction. Yeah. You see, my mind still worked the same way. Just because all of the sudden I was able to overcome the temptation of using did not mean that it was not years and years and years of my life retraining my thought process. And taking on the mind of Christ. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with man, but made himself of no reputation. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself even until the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him yes. and given him a name which is above every name. That in the name of Jesus every name shall bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. And we know scriptures like that but we do not put on the mind of Christ. Yes. 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 You see you can get delivered yes. from your And I came here tonight to tell you that the Lord wants to break you out of the bondage of your Amen. Amen. Sober for three months and I just can't stop thinking about it. Break out of the bondage of your Egypt in the of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm convinced that's one of the reasons the devil won't like me. There's a lot of them, but that's one of them. Because I like to walk into places and I like to just begin to prophesy the word of God over you and make every bondage just fall right off of your life. Like chains that have held you for so many years, they just begin to fall. And they just begin to fall. And some of you are going to walk out of this place tonight because the word of the Lord was declared over your life. And you're going to walk out and you're not going to walk out with the same chains that you no. walked in here with. That was not part of the message either. I know I told you that you could start telling me a minutes ago, but I changed my mind. I got a little bit fired up. I can't help myself. So listen, I wanted to give you a context to what was going on in the life of the Israelites at this time. So now they, they get to this tent of meeting. There's a whole lot that happens in between, but we really don't have time. I'll be here preaching for three hours. Amen. And so they get to this tent of meeting. The glory of the Lord meets with Moses there. The people are now, um, they have built this golden calf. And so the Lord says to Moses, listen, I don't know if I'm going to send you into the promised land now. They've been out in the wilderness for 40 years. It was a journey that should have taken them seven days. Seven days. Can I tell you something? Some of you had a seven-day journey, and you're on like day 58. Come on. Come on now. Hey, listen. I, I, listen, I'm going to be careful how I say this. I'm all for like 12 steps and all that, right? It, it, it helped me somewhat at some point in my life. But can I tell you the only step that you need in your life is full surrender to God. Yeah. 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 Listen, I'm thankful for, yes. for people that do that, and I feel like it yes. serves a purpose. But if you get all of those steps and you miss Jesus in the process, oh, then you feel like you took no steps. So, okay. And so I know that what I'm about to teach on tonight is probably going to be a hard saying for some of you. Paul said, do you hate me now because I tell you the truth? Right. Amen. And listen, I'm just a messenger. 
I didn't write the Bible. I just preached the Bible. Come on. Okay? Come on. So I was throwing tomatoes at me and stuff. Hallelujah. I got on a white shirt. That won't, that won't go there at all. Amen. So listen, here you have the children of Israel. And the Lord decides that they are now not able to enter into the promised land. They've been fighting. They've been arguing. They've been building golden calves and all kinds of idols and all kinds of nonsense. And the Lord was just fed up. He's like, look, you can't go in. That's all there is to it. Joshua and a couple people were able to enter into the land. And so tonight, I'm going to kind of just give you a little bit of context. We're actually going to be in Joshua tonight. I know you're like, you just preached half the book of Exodus, woman. What are you doing? I was just giving you a backdrop to what's going on in the life of the people at this time. Because in Joshua chapter 6, we see something very interesting. Now, I have to say a few things in the beginning about the book of Joshua. I promise I'm not going to preach verse by verse. It would take me a long time. But listen, what you have in the book of Joshua is Moses has died. And now Joshua has been commanded by the Lord to arise and to go over the Jordan River. I find it amazing that the Lord does almost the same exact miracle for Joshua that he did for Moses when he delivered him out of the hand of Pharaoh. Because when Joshua gets to the Jordan River, guess what the Lord does for Joshua and the people of Israel to cross over at that time? He's, he holds back the waters of the Jordan. And these cats, they start taking stones out of the Jordan River. You know, sometimes we hear that wrong, and I know people mean well, but we're like, they took stones and they, you know, they built an altar to the Lord when they crossed over the Jordan River. These people got stones out of the Jordan River. Yeah. I'm like, y'all had crazy faith. You know, because here we are once again at this water moment and these cats are like stopping in the middle of the river picking up stones. That just don't make sense to me, y'all. I'm just telling you the whole truth, but that's what the Bible says that they did. So the Lord instructs Joshua to get the people ready. Okay, he's like, listen, you need to prepare because you are going to go in and you're going to take the land that I promised to Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. And so he's telling the people to prepare. And I find that interesting. And I want to just impart to you in this place tonight that you are going to have to prepare to take your promised land. You are going to have to prepare to walk into the inheritance that the Lord had for you. Because somebody has lied to you somewhere along the way and they have taught you that the only inheritance you have is in heaven. But I came here tonight to tell you that you have an inheritance here on earth. Because we say things like, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we walk around acting like we have to wait till we get to heaven to get the very inheritance that the Lord has for us. You have an inheritance right here on earth. Amen. And I don't know if anybody's told you that, but I did and it was free of charge. It didn't cost you anything. So now Joshua is, is going over and he's going to go into this land. But Joshua has to begin to fight for the very land that God had promised. Because you see, they lost the right to this land because they were in the bondage of Egypt for so long. And then they got stuck out in the wilderness. Now, this is the crazy thing that starts transpiring about chapter 5 of the book of Joshua. The Bible says that the Lord commands Joshua to begin to circumcise the people again. This is the part of the book of Joshua that I can prove to you that the people were delivered out of the hand of Pharaoh, but they still lived in the bondage of Egypt. Because this is the thing. Before Moses took the children of Israel to the parting of the Red Sea, the Lord commanded him to circumcise the children of Israel in that day. So Moses circumcised them before they went in and, and through the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness. But once they got into the wilderness, they stopped the circumcision. So now again, Joshua is given the same command that Moses was. And the Lord tells Joshua to begin to circumcise the people. And you know what the Bible says in chapter 5? The Lord said to Joshua, this day, Joshua... 
Not when the children of Israel were delivered from Pharaoh. Not when they walked through on dry ground. Not when they were out in the wilderness. Oh no, this day, Joshua, have I removed the bondage of Egypt from your people. They were still in the bondage of Egypt until that day. So for 40 years, they were out in the wilderness still living in the bondage of their Egypt. And so now you get to this place that they're done circumcising all the people. And the Bible says in chapter 5, they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. What that basically means is they were healing. Because Joshua went through and he just started circumcising everybody. Amen. Not women. They didn't get circumcised on that day. Hallelujah. But, women have to also birth babies. So... I don't feel like that was a fair trade, but it's fine, Lord. It's fine. <laughs> um, so now we get into chapter 6. Now listen, I love chapter 6 of the book of Joshua. I really do. We know the story about Jericho and, you know, that J Joshua gets commanded. He's like, listen, Joshua, you're going to go and you're going to take these people and they're going to take their ram's horns and you're going to walk around Jericho, you know, seven times. We all know the story. And, but the people have to be quiet all like the first six times around. Listen, I felt nervous for them the first time that I read this in the Bible. I'm just being honest. I was like, Lord, you're asking these people to be quiet. And, and the other crew just got stuck out in the wilderness for 40 years because they couldn't be quiet. I feel like the Lord was testing the people. He wanted to know if they could actually not be the same way of the ones that got stuck in the wilderness for 40 years. Amen. Because in my opinion, there wasn't any other good reason to make them have to be quiet. But I'm not God. I'm just saying I looked at it through a carnal mindset when I first got born again. Okay. And so that's not, that's not theology. That's just what I believe. I'm like, Lord, you must have really wanted to know that these people were going to do what they were supposed to. Amen. And so they get these commands from the Lord that they're going to go. And the first place that they get to, because now they have to fight for this land that was promised to them. Right? So they get to Jericho. And the Lord instructs the people at that time to go into Jericho. But he says something very amazing within this context. So I'm going to start in um, chapter 6, we're going to read a lot down through the story because I really want to get into verse 18. Amen. So Joshua chapter 6 verse 1. It says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because the children of Israel, none went out and none came in. So what the Bible is meaning right here is Jericho had little, literally like shut everybody in the city of Jericho because the people were sorely afraid. We know that from Rahab because when the two spies went in to spy out the land of Jericho, she told the two spies that they were afraid because they had heard what the Lord had done for them, how the Lord had delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh, right? So there was word on the street. I don't know how because they didn't have Facebook in those days, but there was word on the street, amen, that, that the Lord had delivered them. And so they had shut everybody in because they were afraid. Verse 2, and the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. So not only was Joshua going to take the city, he was going to take the very king and the men in that town. Verse 3, And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark of seven trumpets of ram's horns. We call those shofars today. Do y'all y'all use shofars here? Oh, y'all need a shofar. <laughs> George, you, you got you to gotta help them. With the shofar lessons. George's like the best shofar blower. I don't know if that's what you say. Is it a blower? I can't use a shofar. I'm just saying. They're beautiful, especially during deliverance. Devils don't like shofars. Anyway, that was free too. Didn't cost you anything. And so they had these, these rams, which were basically shofars. And the seventh day he shall compass the city seven times, and the priest shall blow with the trumpets. 
and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend every man straight before him. And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns. Yep. So now you have Joshua giving the instructions to the people. He gets the instructions from the Lord. Listen, this is what you're going to do. You're going to take your trumpet, you're going to take your ram's horns, and you guys are going to walk around these walls. And the seventh time around, you're going to shout, and the wall's going to fall down, right? And so now Joshua begins to give the command to, to the people that are with him. And so the Bible says it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And they then armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets and the reward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. So now I'm going to skip down a little bit into verse 18 because now we're going to get to where we're really going. I just wanted you to see what's going on right now in the context, okay? And so actually we're going to back up to verse 17. And so the Lord says, and Joshua is telling the people, this is what the Lord says, talking about the city of Jericho. And the city shall be accursed even if and all that are therein to the Lord only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. So the Lord saying to the people, I know those are big King James fancy words. I don't normally even read out the King James, but... I don't know why I use this one and not my regular Bible. But listen, this is what's happening. The Lord is saying to Joshua, you are going to go in and you're going to take this land. But this land is a curse. And so you cannot take anything out of this land except what was consecrated to the Lord. Okay? Because he said, Joshua, if you do this, then you are going to curse the camp of Israel. You are going to bring destruction upon your people if you take anything out of this land with you. And then he says, but all the silver and gold, bless you, and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So they were allowed to take those things, right? They could take the silver, the gold, the brass, the iron, because those things had been consecrated. They had literally been set apart for the Lord in the land of Jericho. And let me just say right here, you have got to get a life that is set apart to the Lord. Amen. The Lord is looking in this day for a consecrated people that will preach that he is still holy and that he is still righteous. You need a secret place where you begin to break down everything that is not conformed into the image of God and you say be ye holy for he is holy. Amen. You have to consecrate yourself. And so verse 20 says, so the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets and it came to pass. When the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. So here they are. Then cats stay quiet for six times, y'all. That's a miracle. Yeah. You know, sometimes I think we miss the miracles in the Bible. These people stay quiet six times. They marched around a whole city. We're not talking about a block. They didn't just bust a block being quiet. They busted a whole city being quiet six times. And then on the seventh time, they shout, and this wall comes down, and they begin to go into the city, and they take the city. This is where the story gets a little sideways. Verse 21, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man, woman, woman, 
young and old, and ox and sheep, and ass with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and bring out the woman, and all that she has, as you swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in, and they brought out Rahab, and her father, and mother, and brethren, and all that she had. And they brought out all of her kindred, and they left them without the camp of Israel. So they kept their word to Rahab. We know that because Jesus actually, in the genealogy of Jesus in the book of Matthew, Rahab is actually in the bloodline of Jesus. And that just goes to show you that Jesus can take you from a prostitute to royalty if you got well pleased with it. Rahab and her father's household and all that she had. And Joshua adjured them at the same time saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and builds this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was noised throughout the country. Now listen, what ends up happening is there was actually two men when you get into chapter 8, which we're not going to get there because I want to just talk to you for a minute, okay? There were two men in chapter 8 that they actually took things out of the land of Jericho. They took the thing that the Bible says would bring a curse upon the camp of Israel. So when they go to go into the next city to conquer that city, the Lord instructs Joshua only to send so much of his army because guess what? They got overtaken because they had brought a curse on the camp of Israel. And they had to get rid of the accursed thing to be able to be victorious again. So listen, this is what you have going on right now. You have people in your camp that have an accursed thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you are stuck rebuilding your Jericho when it's not your promised land. Because this is what happens. We get delivered out of the hand of Pharaoh. We stay in the bondage of our Egypt. We finally break out of the bondage of our Egypt, but we haven't changed our mindset. Yes. Yes. Come on. Yes. And so because the people had not changed their mindset, and this was a whole new people. But listen, that's the, that's the thing about generational curses. Yeah. They were born into the same curse Amen. that the children that died in the wilderness were, were under. Because that curse went down in their bloodline. And I love you enough to tell you that you can have every demon known to man cast out of you. But if you do not come out from underneath the generational curse of addiction and poverty and all of those different things, destruction and divorce and all of those different things, those are generational curses. You are taking an accursed thing and you're trying to get to your promised land. And you can't do that. The children of God can no longer afford to be trying to fight, to go into their inheritance, to try to fight, to go into their promised land. But you've got an accursed thing in your pocket. You've got an accursed thing in your bloodline. You've got an accursed thing in your phone. Some of you need a new phone number. Some of you need watching porn in the middle of the night. prophet Joel when he said in the last day saith the Lord I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh upon all flesh the book of Haggai says the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the first you see there is a glory coming to the children of God in this hour and if you want to be in the glory of the Lord you have got to get out of the accursed thing you have of your Egypt. You can no longer afford to have the, bank, 
have the same mindset. You can no longer afford to have the same friends. You can no longer afford to wake up at midnight and watch porn while your wife's in the room next to you, praying that your baby don't wake up. Y'all better get it together. The Lord is pouring out His Spirit. And if you want You see, somewhere along the way, we talk people like, well, you can just stop doing drugs, yeah. and you can Amen. just stop listening to secular music, Amen. and you can just stop doing this, and you can just stop doing that. But, I mean, if you still have bitterness in your heart, it's fine. Yeah. Come on. Right? If you still watch porn, it's fine. If you're still like secretly lusting after that woman or that yeah, man at work when your husband and wife don't know about it, it's fine. Come on, preach. But what you don't realize is you, is you brought a curse upon your home. Yeah. Amen. You're cursing your bloodline. You're cursing your children. Yeah. You're bringing an accursed thing that has not been consecrated and set apart to the Lord. And you find yourself in the same cycle and the same cycle and the same cycle. Let me tell you who the father of cycles is. It's the devil. Yeah. You want to know? was the same. 
It was the same cycle over and over and over and over again because nobody ever said, Ty, break out of the cycle. You've taken an accursed thing from the land of Jericho with you. And so I would get in these cycles and then I would be fine and then I would be not fine. Right? I'd be back in the bed. And then I'd show up to church, you know, because it was the pastoral thing to do. <laughs> Amen. And everybody thought that I was okay. And I'd go home and I was in the bed. Literally, this went on for years, right? And so then, all of a sudden, one day, the Lord began to set me free and begin to change my mindset. Now listen, the Lord himself taught me this. Nobody ever stood with a microphone and said, Ty, you got to stop doing all that, right? Yeah. I had to learn things the hard way. But this is what I know. When we learned about deliverance, I was like, yes. This, this is what it is, right? This demon's got to go, and I've had some demons, y'all. I ain't going to lie, I had a lot of demons, amen. But listen, I, I got deliverance from demons, and still, I was like, I mean, I was better. I was getting better. Every little thing that we learned, I was getting better and better, right? But then there was still, like, there was something. And I, and I couldn't figure out what it was. I couldn't figure out what is still holding me, right? What still has a hold on me? Because there's just no way that it can be a demon. Now, listen. There was no way that it could have been a demon, okay? I had more deliverance than, than anybody probably has ever had deliverance because I kept going back thinking I had a demon. I'm like, look, give me a testimony. I'm like, y'all got to help me. You got to pray for me. You got to get this thing out of me because I kept thinking I had a demon, but really I just brought an accursed thing into the land of Jericho, out of the land of Jericho with me. I was trying to go into my promised land, trying to go into full freedom. And the truth is, is that I just had an accursed thing. You know what my accursed thing was? Bitterness. Come on. It was that thing that nobody could see. It was that unforgiveness that I had for my mother. It was that unforgiveness for, that I had for the father that walked out on me when I was two years old. It was that unforgiveness for that deadbeat baby daddy, right? I'm just being real with y'all. It was that bitterness inside of me. You see, I was fighting so hard for my promised land. I'm like, Lord, I, I stand on stages and I preach where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But I was so bound by bitterness that wasn't even a demon. It was just an accursed thing that I picked up in Egypt that I never left behind. Amen. Some of you have some things that you picked up in Egypt that you never left behind. And this is the thing. In this hour, in this day, the Lord is calling you to leave that thing behind. Because he wants you to possess your promised land. You have a promise here on earth. You have an inheritance here on earth. So listen, I'm not the Holy Spirit. And I'm not God. But when I tell you that some of you tonight in this place, you're like, Lord, was she? Has she been listening to my prayers? Because I've been asking God, like, what is this thing? What is this thing? What is this thing? How much deliverance do I need, right? And the Lord is saying tonight, whatever it is that you took out of Egypt with you, that you took that accursed thing, you got into your Jericho, you shouted, those walls came down, you broke out of that prison, but you took something with you that you weren't supposed to. And whatever that thing is, right now, tonight, in this place, the Lord wants you to leave that thing right here. Come on now. The Lord wants you to leave that thing right here. Amen. And you have to be warned at this point. You see, the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, if you warn them, their blood is no longer on your hands. So listen, when I walk out of here tonight, your blood is no longer on my hands. Amen. I love you enough to tell you the truth. That you've been delivered 
You still got some bondage, and you need to leave it right here, right now in this place. Come on. And I can't tell you what that is. I can't tell you if it's unforgiveness. I can't tell you if it's weed because you got delivered from meth and you thought it was still cool to smoke weed. It's not. <laughs> right? It's not. That's not pleasing to the Lord. I don't care what nobody says to you. I convinced myself of the same thing. I smoked weed for five years and tried to convince myself that I was sober. What? I wasn't sober. I was still getting high. It just didn't look like the same high, right? Some of you traded pills in for a bottle of wine at night. Because it, but this is the thing. You still have the same mindset. That's why you do it. It's not that drinking a glass of wine at night is that terribly wrong. I'm I'm a I'm an altogether person though, right? I'm like I'm out on all of it at this point in my life, right? I don't I don't condone any of it. But I'm saying some of you have taken taken something in your life that you've convinced yourself that you left behind in Egypt. And you've just replaced it with something else. But this is the thing. You're still feeding the same thing within you. You're still fulfilling the same desire within you. And so tonight in this place, in this moment, the Lord is calling you right now to say, okay, God, you can have this thing. I don't want this.